So let's start with a mathematical definition of a conic, which is this picture you see here. You can also look at different cross sections of a conic, and that will give you horizontal cross section, a circle, a little bit tilted will give you ellipse. This cross section, you can see it's a parabola, and this cross section is a hyperbola. A conic definition is all points or a locus of points that have the ratio of its distance from fixed point to a fixed line in the plane, a constant e. If e is 0, we get a circle. If e is between 0 and 1, we get an ellipse. If e is 1, we get parabola. And e is greater than 1, we get a hyperbola. The fixed point is called the focus, and the fixed line is called the directrix. We will look at the conic sections in the following way. We will ask you to generate locus of points that satisfy some conditions. And when you actually look at those points, you will end up with one of these conic sections. Let's start with the following three exercises that you will do. So pause the video here, do these exercises we're asking you, and then we'll come back and see what you get. So you have a fixed point and a fixed line. Get all points that are exactly same distance from this F as they are from the line L. Go ahead, see what you can do. And then when you're done with those, take two fixed points and find all points so that their sum of their distance from F1 and F2 is exactly the same. So if you took a string, Fix one end on F1, one end on F2, stretch it all the way out, and see what are all the points that would have exactly the same sum, which means that the distance is fixed from F1 and F2. So take that string to make your prediction of what that collection of points would look like. And then instead of sum, you want the difference of those distances from F1, F2 fixed, what happens then? See if you can predict what that would look like. Go ahead, pause the video, play with it, and then come back. It is possible that you will feel you can't do it, but in the minimum, find at least one point that is exactly the same distance from F and same distance from F as it is from L. Go ahead. If you collect all points that are equidistant from the line as they are from the focus, this is what it would look like. You can see how the points actually trace a shape you already have seen. Can you recognize what that is? Very good, it's a parabola. And so all points that are exactly the same distance from a fixed point and a fixed line form a parabola. Not only that, and reflective property of parabolas is that if focus is where energy source is located, and the parabola is a reflective surface, then all the rays that are coming out of that focus point will bounce straight up from the parabola, making it a wider beam. You see this principle in headlights, searchlights. Also, if there's an energy source located in a distance and you have a parabolic mirror, the light will bounce off of the mirror and come right to the focus point. This principle is used in satellite dishes. So there are many applications of parabolas, and so we will look at how to find their equations. What if instead of a fixed line, you have two fixed points? Let's say you have two focus points, fixed points F1 and F2. And I ask you to find all points that are exactly the same sum away from F1, F2. In other words, F2 plus the distance PF2 plus PF1 is a constant. What kind of points would those be? Let's zoom in and see. So let's zoom in and see. If you collect all such points, what you will notice is they form this shape called ellipse, and that the sum F2 to P plus P to F1 is a constant. This shape is called an ellipse. It's as if you took a piece of string, fixed it at these two ends, and stretched it all the way out. 
and then went up and down, this is exactly what shape you will end up with. Reflective property for ellipses is that if a light or sound wave leaving in any direction from one of the focus points will reflect off of the ellipse and arrive at the other focus point of the ellipse. This principle, so if energy is generated in this focus point, it will go up to ellipse and bounce right back to the other focal point. This is used in whispering galleries where one person stands at one focal point and then there's a reflective surface. You can whisper and it will bounce off and go to the other person because it will bounce off the other side where there's an elliptical surface reflecting off your voice to that person. You can see this in the robot world in Wisconsin Dells and many other places in the Capitol Dome. No matter how crowded the room is, if a person is standing at one of the focal points, then the voice will bounce off the ceiling and go back to the other person that's standing at the other focal point. This is also used in medicine where elliptical reflectors are used to treat kidney stones without surgery. So shock waves are generated at one focal point outside the patient's body and then the waves will bounce off the other elliptical surface right where the kidney stones are placed at the other focus point. See if you can find the name of such a medical device. If you wanted the difference to be the same, that means PF2 minus PF1, that absolute value, the difference is exactly the same and you end up with P, P1, H double prime, G double prime, so look what happens when I trace those. If I want the distance to the difference between the points to be the same, P to F2 minus P to F1 is a constant. This shape is called hyperbola. Just like ellipses and parabolas, hyperbolas have reflective properties. See if you can find what the reflective property of hyperbola is and why that property is useful in making the nuclear reactor cooling towers hyperbolic. So go ahead and you do that on your own to satisfy your curiosity. How do mathematicians come up with equation of the parabola to find the vertex and directrix in it? So let's recall, if our vertex is hk, our vertex is this point right here, hk. And let's say P is how far away the focus is and the directrix is from the vertex. So P down from the vertex. So if K is the Y coordinate of the vertex, then P down from it will make it K minus P. P up from it will make it K plus P. So that's how you get the focus coordinates are H, K plus P, and the directrix equation is Y equals K minus P. Since we know the distance from P to L is going to be Y, which is all the way to down here, minus the K minus P, and then the distance from F to P is the square root X minus H bracket squared, Y minus K plus P bracket squared. So instead of working with square roots, we can square both sides, and so we will have the square of y minus k minus p squared equals x minus h squared plus y minus k plus p squared. If you open the brackets up and algebraically manipulate all the variables, you can rewrite it as 4p times y minus k equals x minus h squared. If you remember our equations of parabola as x minus h squared times a constant plus another constant k, that A that we used to have in the vertex form is actually 1 over 4P. So the information for focus and directrix was already hidden in there, but now you see it. We didn't talk about focus and directrix when we saw parabolas before. So you can see how much information is buried in the vertex form of the parabolic equation. What if you change the x and the y, and the parabola is going sideways? All the y's will become x's, x's will become y's, 
then H and K will reverse their places. If P is positive, parabola faces up. P is negative, parabola faces down. If you had X equals Y minus K squared equations, P positive will give you parabola facing to the right, and negative will give you parabolas facing to the left. Let's do an example of a parabola. We've done many parabola examples when we were looking at polynomial functions. So let's just do one. Let's say equation is y equals 1 8 x minus 2 squared minus 3. We already know vertex is 2, negative 3. The new part is the 1 over 8. Our coefficient is 1 over 8, which is 1 over 4p. Solving for p will give you p equals 2. So that means our focus, which is p units above the vertex, so 1, 2, which means the x coordinate will be 2, and the y coordinate will be 2 up from negative 3, so negative 2, negative 1. So focus is 2, negative 1, and then if you go the same amount down, you will get directrix, which will be y equals negative 5. So here's a summary. If you have y equals 1 over 4px minus h squared plus kp positive, Parabola faces up, P negative, parabola faces down. If you have x equals 1 over 4PY minus K squared plus H, P positive, parabola faces to the right, P negative, parabola faces to the left. So a circle is a collection of all points that are at a fixed distance from a fixed point. A fixed point is called center, fixed distance is called the radius. You can get the algebraic equation by looking at distance xy to hk is r, so square root x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r. If you square both sides, you will end up with r squared equals x minus h squared plus y minus k squared. Center is hk, radius is r. All right, pause the video here, see if you can do these five examples, then we'll come and check together. Go ahead. Sketch the graph of that equation, x minus 2 squared plus y plus 1 squared equals 9. Find the equation of the circles given the conditions, and find the center and radius when your equation is given. Complete squares to get center and radius, and then find the equation of circle that is already graphed for you. So go ahead, pause the video here. Might take you a while, so go ahead, pause, do all five, and then come back. You know the drill. Let's go. All right, assuming you've come back, we have x. Assuming you've come back, let's take a look x minus 2 squared, y plus 1 squared, which means our center is 2, negative 1, radius is 3. So 2, negative 1, radius is 3, and then connect all the points. So you have our circle of radius 3 and center 2, negative 1. To find the equation, since the center is 3, 5, we have x minus 3 squared plus y minus 5 squared equals radius squared, which is 2 squared. And the other one will be x minus minus 3 squared plus y minus 7 squared equals 5 squared, or x plus 3 bracket squared plus y minus 7 squared equals 25. For number 3, center is 6, negative 3, radius is 7. Do you remember how to complete squares? You have x squared minus 12x, half of negative 12 is negative 6, negative 6 squared is 36. So we're going to add positive 36. Half of 8 is 4. 4 squared is 16, so you're going to add 16. If you change the left-hand side, you change the right-hand side by the same amount. And so now we have x minus 6 squared plus y plus 4 squared equals 64. So basically, the graph is going to be a circle with center 6, negative 4, and radius of 8. To find the equation on number 5, you can see the radius. You have radius is 3, and the center is 3, negative 2. And so one 
two, three radius is three. So to get equation, we have center is three negative two, radius is one, two, three. You can count and see. And so our equation is going to be x minus 3 squared plus y plus 2 squared, because y minus minus 2 equals 9. Go ahead, pause the video, see what you can do for ellipses. Go ahead, try them on your own first. All right, assuming you've come back, let's take a look. The first one, you have to graph. You already know negative 2, 3 is your center. The a is going to be square root of 64, which is 8. b is going to be square root 25, which is 5. Stretches 8 to the left and right, and 5 up and down. The length of the major axis is the difference between a squared minus b squared absolute value, square root of that. And then your foci are located negative 2 plus square root 39, 3, and negative 2 minus square root 39, 3, because h plus c and h minus c gives you your foci on the major axis. This time, the major axis is horizontal. The vertices are located negative 2 plus 8, which is 6 and 3, and negative 2 minus 8, so that will give you negative 10, 3. For number 2, again, completing the squares. By now, you should know how to complete squares. Otherwise, take a look. Factor 4 out. x squared plus 4x, half of 4 is 2. 2 squared is 4. Half of 2 is 1. 1 squared is 1. But what you're really adding is 4 times 4, 16. 9 times 1, which is 9. That's why you're adding. 16 plus 9 here on the right-hand side. So we have 4 times x plus 2 squared plus 9 times y plus 1 squared equals 144. Divide everything by 144 gives you this equation. This is in the standard form. So our vertex is negative 2, negative 1. Center A is 6, B is 4. So you're going to go 6 left and right, 4 up and down. And so you have answered. They asked you to sketch the graph, so you needed vertices and center. Next one, again, complete the squares. 25 times 9 is 225. 9 times 4 is 36. That's why you're adding those. And dividing by 225 gives you this. They also asked you to locate center, vertices, and foci. The foci are c units in on the major axis. This time, the major axis is vertical. So you're going to add the c to the y coordinate of the vertex. So it will become 3 for the x coordinate, and then negative 2 plus 4, and negative 2 minus 4. Those are the two foci that are located up and down from the center of the ellipse. The graph is given to you, so you can see the center is negative 2, 3. And you're going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then 1, 2, up. So 5 left and right, 2 up and down, which gives you the equation of the ellipse. And then the foci, once you find the c, will be negative 2 plus or minus square root 21, 3. And negative 2 plus or minus 5, 3 are your vertices as a horizontal major axis. So in this example, 3, negative 4 is our center. 1, 2, 3, 4 up. 1, 2, 3, 4 down. So our b is 4. a is 3, because you're going 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 sideways. So our equation will be x minus 3 squared over 9 plus y plus 4 bracket squared over 16 equals 1. Our c, which is 16 minus 9 square root, which is 7, square root 7. So 3 and negative 4 plus or minus square root 7. Vertices are going to be 3 and negative 4 plus or minus the b in this case, which is 4. So vertices are 3, 0 and 3, negative 8, which you can actually see from the graph here, because your 
major axis is vertical here. All right, let's take a look at hyperbola examples. So go ahead, pause the video here, use your knowledge of ellipses to see if you can sketch the graph of these hyperbolas. Go ahead, pause the video here, see what you can do. Go ahead, try it on your own, at least the first two. All right, assuming you've come back, let's take a look. So in the first one, note that a is square root 9, which is 3, b is square root 4, just like when we were doing ellipses. The c, instead of being 9 minus 4, is 9 plus 4, square root of that, or square root 13. And so we have our center is 2, 3. That's the same as when we were doing ellipses. Our asymptotes are going to be y minus 3 equals the slope, which is b over a, or 2 thirds x minus 2, and y minus 3 equals negative 2 thirds x minus 2. So we will plot the center, plot the asymptotes. So if you look, our, per, our hyperbola, because the negative sign is with the y, if x is any number 2 or more, you have something positive here equaling 1, especially if y is 0, which is possible. But when x is 2, you cannot have negative y something squared equaling 1. So our hyperbola is going to be left, right. The foci, there's foci are going to be inside to the left and to the right of the center. So here we have our vertices, 2 minus 3 and 3, 2 plus 3 and 3. And so we have our vertices, asymptotes, foci, and center plotted. Once you have that, our hyperbola is going to be sideways, and our diagonals of this box. So the box is not part of your hyperbola, but you're using the box to create your asymptotes by connecting the diagonals of the box. And then because our hyperbola is sideways, our foci are to the left and right of the vertices or the center. And so when you plot the hyperbola, it will look like this. All right, next one. So we have completing the square. So this time, the negative sign is with the x coordinate. So when we complete squares, we get the following. Negative 4 times 4 is negative 16. That's what this negative 16 on the other side is to compensate. 9 times 1 is 9. Again, we're compensating so that we haven't changed the original equation. So once we have that, completing the square gives us negative 4 times x plus 2 squared plus 9 times y plus 1 squared equals 36. Or dividing everything by 36, we get it in the correct form. So now we can see our center is going to be negative 2, negative 1. a is 3, b is 2. And this time, the hyperbola is going upright. So let's see how we can graph that. And so we have our asymptotes, our vertices, our foci. And so you can, of course, create the box. And then the diagonals of the box are your asymptotes. And the vertices are up here and down here, and you connect. So for number 3a, again, we can complete the squares. And you'll notice that since they're all plus signs, that we have an ellipse. And so you find the center, vertices, foci, and then you plot. If you have only one square term and you complete the squares, you will see that this is a parabola. And the vertex is going to be x is negative 3, y is positive 3. Our a is 1 over 8, which is greater than 0, which means it opens to the right. And the foci is negative 1, 3. You can see in part C, again, completing the square will give you one negative sign, which means it's going to be a hyperbola. And completing the square gives you what the graph will look like. Negative is with the x, so it's up, down, hyperbola. And center is negative 2, positive 3. And then you can make the box to get the diagonals for your asymptotes, and then sketch the graph. So after seeing what the graphs of quadratic equations in two variables looks like, natural question to ask would be what happens 
if we have a generic quadratic equation in two variables, so that would be ax squared plus by squared plus cxy plus dx plus fy plus g equals 0, what would that graph look like? So in order to explore that, let's go and play with Desmos. Use this link, please. All right, so in Desmos, you can see that when I put a equals 1, b and c are 0. b and c 0 means it's just a quadratic function in one variable, which you already know, x squared graphs, if a is positive or negative, will dictate whether you have a uh, parabola facing down or up. If all the variables are on the same side and you take the x squared terms to one side and y to the second side, you will see that that's really a equals negative 1. That's why the parabola is facing down. Now what happens if b is not 0? So if I change the b, you can see how it switches from hyperbolas to parabolas if I make b 0. If I change the c values, look what happens. I get hyperbolas, but they are actually turned a so many degrees. And then if you change the d and then f and g, you can see the direction of the hyperbola changes. So let's make our a negative, our b negative, so you can see that playing with it, you can see what each of those variables control. And then that will tell you that any quadratic equation, it's either going to be a parabola or an ellipse or hyperbola, depending on the values of a, b, and c. So here are some interesting examples. You can plot these in Desmos and see for yourself that we have a rotated ellipse hyperbola, another ellipse, hyperbola. So you can play and see what this would look like. So in summary, to identify our conic sections, let's give you some tips. You will get a parabola when there is only one variable square term. So for example, 3x squared minus 4y plus x minus 1. You will get a parabola facing up. 3x squared plus 4y plus x minus 1 parabola facing down because the coefficient of x squared is what you're looking for. So y terms on one side, x terms on one side. You can see that this 3 quarters x squared positive, so facing up. Negative 3 quarters x squared facing down parabola. x equals 3 quarters y squared facing right parabola x equals negative 3 quarters y squared, left hand facing parabola. And that the focus is going to be p units from the vertex. To identify ellipse, you must have x squared and y squared terms. Both have the same sign when they are on the same left hand side or right hand side. And same sign coefficients means it's going to be uh, ellipse a special case of an ellipse when they both have the same coefficients, you will get a circle. To so get a hyperbola, you must have both x squared, y squared coefficients, non-zero and of different signs. If they're both on the same side and y coefficient is negative, x is positive, you will get a hyperbola opening left, right. If x coefficient is negative, y coefficient positive, you'll get a hyperbola opening up down. So you can use these tips to identify whether you have a parabola, hyperbola, or ellipse.